welcome to the Scrum Diego podcast. I am your host with the most, Alex Corbisera, and it is great to be back, everyone. Apologies to our diehard fans who are messaging where was the podcast. We had a holiday break over the Christmas period, but now, as preseason is among us here in the MLR, it's time to get back to week-to-week episodes. We're not going anywhere, and we're kicking off this new year with a bang. We have a heavy hitter on the pod this week. We have USA Rugby Eagle, San Diego Legion star, Nate Orsberger, to talk through it all. Nate, welcome to the pod. The man next to me is none other than Nate Orsberger, USA Rugby Eagle, the first American to ever score against the All Blacks and San Diego Legion OG from their inception year in the MLR. Nate, welcome to the Scrum Diego yeah. podcast. Thanks for having me, Corbs. Appreciate it, man. No, nah, man, I knew you'd be a good guest. You're not shy of a podcast anyway. And I know, you know, obviously you've got the Quick Tap podcast under your belt still and, and a lot of other projects that we're going to get into in this episode. But cool. it's great to have you on and, and give you a chance to shine. And, uh, you know, we'll ask the questions and let our sort of fans get into learning a bit more about you. Perfect, man. Ready for year six. Let's go. Let's go, mate. How's how's it all going? How's the off season been? And, and how are you feeling at the beginning of the of this exciting preseason block? Yeah, it's been it's been really good, Corbs. Uh, you know, I was I was fortunate enough to get to represent with the Eagles. Um, you know, a lot of people have asked me, oh, how was the tour? And and they feel for the heartbreak that that we felt going against Portugal. But honestly, it was it was still a really good tour and it was really fun to be around. You know, I kind of was one of the older guys, so yeah. we had some younger faces around, and uh, so that was that was that was great, and I was lucky to come out of there healthy, and um, yeah, we've had we've had boys rolling in from overseas, we've had uh, guys who've been uh, putting in the hard yards here locally in San Diego, and so it's all pretty exciting, and everybody who's come in here has has come with a pretty similar mindset, and that's to win, so. Um, yeah, it's it's all exciting the way we finished 2022 and it's been a good start so far. No, definitely some wins in the sales. I feel it as well. Obviously bias as well. Same. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Same. But it, it's good to it's good to feel that and I, I generally believe it. Um, I think before we get into a lot of the here and now and, and what's going on with Legion to USA to to other things, I want to just get you know go through your rugby journey a little bit because. You, similar to maybe a Ryan Mattias and a few other in his teams, you guys are of a generation of player that fortunately in America came to the game early enough to really take to it and have quite a viable career. And I think one of the things that I look at you, um, you know, from the outside in, I've always said that I feel like you are the best scrum half that was ever born and raised in America, like that there's ever been. Do you know what I mean? And there's arguments of foreigners or potentially who, but I just think that's such a credit and such a hard position to get to where you had. Like, let's talk a little bit about the journey and how this came about. No, I appreciate you saying that. And uh, so my my dad um, moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, he was working out there and he ended up getting recruited by uh, the Olympians, dad, Katie Johnson's dad, who played rugby. And so they actually lived across the street from each other. Uh, we grew up right across the street from one another. And so ever since I was about five years old, we were all, you know, running around, throwing the rugby ball, had no idea what we were watching. I I remember like, you know, we'd be flying kites and chasing each other around all day long. So we were already around the rugby community, which I think was really cool, but it didn't really hit us until those guys who were playing the game, my dad, her dad, Dan Johnson, they started teaching us and and properly organized uh, youth camps and clinics and stuff for kids in the metro area. So we started learning the game at about 11 years old, like proper learning. Uh, We did our first organized game when I was 13 and uh, we drove about an hour and a half to go play this team. And uh, it was pretty much like watching seven year olds play soccer. (laughs) You know, everybody's chasing the ball around, but um, it was great. And then uh, I actually started playing high school rugby when I was in eighth grade. So my older brother started playing rugby when he was a sophomore in high school. And my dad kind of, uh, you know, referees actually used to go up to my dad and be like, hey, Andy, are you sure you want to let him play? Because I was always undersized. I was small. And my dad was always like, yeah, let him go. Let him go. I was really competitive and like I just kind of a fearless like little dude. So. I would go out there and make tackles on the wing. And uh, I did that for a while. And, and I was fortunate enough to also have a, 
a coach um, who's Samoan, uh, Sam Robinson, who came from Hawaii, uh, moved to Minneapolis. He actually played rugby out in Australia. Um, and uh, he taught me a lot and he kind of he kind of saw a vision of me being able to play scrum half and, and continue to play the game at a high level. So I was, I was really fortunate to play all through high school, uh, went to college and played with my older brother as well. Me and him were nine and 10 combos. So that was oh, pretty, sick. yeah, it was, it was really fun. He was the captain of the team. And when he moved on, I was fortunate enough to captain for one year. Um, I actually ended up playing fly half my senior year because we had another young guy who could deliver. So it was, it was great, man. And uh, I'm just super, super fortunate that you know, I got to, my dad busted out a 2003 Rugby World Cup VHS. I seen uh, Shane Williams carving up against the All Blacks at one point, And I was like, who's the little dude? You know, who's the short guy? That's it. Um, so, yeah, just I just always kind of got drawn to the game. And I always wanted to play sport professionally. A first, original dream would have been football, right? Um, but for a guy my size and stature, I mean, I graduated high school probably about, five foot five, 135 pounds. So, yeah. uh, you know, I wasn't getting much looks at yeah, yeah. football. Um, so yeah, I, I just rugby fell into my lap, man. It's been the greatest thing, greatest thing that could have happened. That's awesome. And like, what was it like sort of growing up and being a rugby kid in America? Cause it's a bit of a niche sport, but it's kind of like a fraternity and has it's like hardcore core sort of uh, universe in the US, but yeah. it is like, it is an interesting path to be one of those guys It's like, no, I'm not playing football. I'm not doing that. Like, right. I'm committing to rugby. Yeah. So I, the first time I actually had to like, uh, address that was I was playing, uh, like traveling league baseball. So I like tried out, made that team or whatever. Um, and I had a great time playing baseball, but that was the first time where it was like, well, Nate, you either have to play baseball or you have to play rugby because they're in the same season. So I played football in the fall. I wrestled in the winter only for a couple years in high school. And then I played rugby in the, in the um, spring. So I chose rugby and um, growing up, it was just like, yeah, you're, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. There's like some people are in it, they learn about it and they're totally gung ho about it, you know? Um, but I always, I always had a enjoyable time because I was respected enough in my football team and the other sports that I played that, um, we actually were able to get out guys that maybe wouldn't have even looked at a rugby yeah. ball. They would have been like, I don't know that sport. I'm not going to do it. Uh, so guys like my older brother, other guys that were on our team were good enough athletes that we were able to actually recruit other guys who would have been like, eh, I'm not sure I want to go do something that I have no idea how to do. We were able to recruit those guys. So like our high school team, we went to three straight uh, state championships in Minnesota and uh, we won two, lost one. Um, and Still then, burns. Still yeah, burns. yeah, yeah, right, exactly. We lost to some good friends. Actually, Katie Johnson's older brother was uh, was on that Hopkins team, and Dan Johnson was the coach. So my dad coached our team. <laughs> oh, nice. So there's a little little history there, but um, yeah, it was just always like, what's rugby? I'll show you. You know, come yeah. out and come out and try it. That was, that was pretty much it. That's sick, mate. And I think um, you know, what was the path through college? Like, cause I think it's a different ball game for kids in America now who have an MLR draft. There's sevens still going on. Um, like what what was it when you came out of high school? What opportunities? Like how did you were you able to still commit and chase the rugby dream? I was, I was because, you know, rugby's primarily a club sport at most universities or, or colleges, right? So I went to the University of Minnesota. It was a division one club. So um, in the years leading up, they had a very, very good team, a competitive team. They went to nationals. They beat Utah the year before I joined. Um, and then we went to nationals my freshman year and played against Cal Berkeley and got absolutely rinsed. Uh, Danny Barrett was on that team. So, you know, he'll, he'll never forget that. Right. I, I mean, we were probably a walkover game to them, yeah. you know, to what Cal Berkeley is compared to university of Minnesota and compared to like a BYU or some of these other colleges. So, I think um, the way it's changed now, obviously, I think there's a bit more of a spotlight to find collegiate talent where for me, you know, uh, Sean Davies was the best scrum half and he was at BYU and he was uh, ended up being my teammate at USA. But like I, I couldn't get that kind of notoriety playing for a, a collegiate team like the University of Minnesota and, you know, unless I got yeah. spotted at nationals. So for 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 collegiate kids, I actually um, encourage them to play men's sevens club rugby in the, in the off seasons or make sure they're playing sevens. Cause that ultimately 
was the way that I got spotted into the USA pathway. So I was a collegiate All-American for sevens um, my senior year, the last year. So I finally got discovered. I was playing with my uh, club rugby team, the Young Bloods. We were doing really well. We got fourth at nationals, then we got sixth. I actually lost to Mikey Tails, Belmont Shore. Ooh. Yeah, in the um, semifinal that the the year we took fourth. Uh, played against Mako Unafe. Yeah. Uh, he was playing for Utah. We played them in the third, fourth place game. So that was always cool. But cool. that kind of led into my my USA pathway, which, you know, um, has kind of set me on this last last 10 years. Let's talk a little bit about it, because I think this is important, because say you had come through the system now, you most likely would have got drafted out of college or maybe done one year somewhere or sevens for a bit and then been looking at the MLR. But once you left college, you, you played it, was it Old Blue? Yeah. And, and like, how was the pathway till sort of pro and, and MLR sort of came up? Yeah, so I actually resorted to, to club rugby with Old Blue after I'd gotten cut from the sevens team. So I went... I was in the first uh, residential full-time at Chula Vista Training, Olympic Training Center. I was one of the original guys there and I was there for 18 months and I got cut from there. So that's when I actually had to revert back to using Old Blue as my training ground to try and get back into USA, yeah. um, which I ultimately did. But uh, yeah, that was that was its, whole, its own ordeal. You know, it's one of those things where when you join a men's club team, there's so many great things that happen from like a social side. Like I got guys that were in my wedding line from that team. Like I, I can't speak highly enough about what what club rugby is meant to be for most people. But as a guy who wanted to get where I was going, um, I knew I had to train more than most yep. of my teammates. I had to find other guys that I could bring along with me because, you know, you need support. Um, and so like that that whole dynamic was just like a lot of ownership on yourself into individually and and fortunately i had enough good pieces around me good good guidance from uh steve lewis who's out at um the iron workers right yep. now and then marty veal who won the championship with rooney last year um those were my coaches so I, I was very lucky to be on a club team that was aspiring to be the best club team in the country let's talk a little bit further ahead and so you know you've come out of of old blue you got back to the sevens program i did yep. for a while like how, how did that go it was great um mike friday had come in and uh you know i'm i'm a mike friday kind of guy he just loves guys who grind work hard um so i uh got into my first camp i'm doing well, running my yo-yos and stuff with Perry and Carlin. It was just great. I was just putting my stamp because I knew I wanted to be there. I knew I belonged there. Um, I got selected for every single tournament uh, for the next year leading up to the Olympics and uh, just fell short. I mean, I, I went to the Olympics as a traveling reserve, um, but yeah, I helped, helped them qualify, got to go to Rio, got to get the whole experience other than getting to actually yeah. take the field. Um, but it was it was the proving ground for me. I mean, sevens, as we all know, like it's a fundamental game. You learn a lot about the basics. I mean, I can tell you that I've been on a lot of 15s teams where it's like we don't need the scrum half to clear breakdowns. <laughs> but like if I needed to, I'm equipped to do it because I played sevens got and it. I and I got the reps. I have the you know. Um, so yeah, it was it was actually a, a a big test because I was behind Madison Hughes. I would get my minutes, you know, various minutes. Sometimes it was good minutes, sometimes it was small minutes, you know, and Friday would tell you that me and him had a lot of conversations, but it, it grew me as a rugby player and prepared me for uh, for what I was gonna step into with professional and international 15s. Yeah, so then after Rio, um, there's still no MLR, like pro rugby was kind of on the horizon, I think then 2017 yep. sort of time, maybe 2016 as well, I can't remember. I think it was 2016 yeah. into 2017 maybe. So maybe that, that's why you missed it with uh, the Olympics obviously being like, is it only the lasted primary. one year? Yeah, I got yep. it. Um, what were your opportunities after just missing out on the Olympics? So after that, I uh, did the classic, like the generation before me, what all American rugby players that played internationally, the Mike Petries, the Lou Stanfields, like I did what most of those guys do. I went back to New York City. I played club rugby for Old Blue and once again, used that as my team to stay fit and stay ready. And I actually had gotten capped right before the Olympics. I had gotten my first two caps. I played against Italy. Um, at scrum half under John Mitchell, and then I played against Russia. And so once I finished the Olympics, I moved back to New York City. I was fully committed to the Eagles 15s team. 
And uh, we went on and won the 2017 ARC championship that year. Uh, we qualified for the Rugby World Cup uh, in 2019, for 2019 that year. And so my 15s uh, international career had pretty much taken off, but I was using Old Blue uh, as, as, the, as the trainer for it. And how do you live when you're playing at Old Blue in club rugby? Like, what, do you have a job there? They help you out? Like, how, do, how does it work? Yeah, yeah. So Old Blue's always, always been great. So I, I was able to uh, have housing. Um, I was able to uh, coach for Play Rugby USA. So I was a youth development coach and a mentor in, in that program. And that was always good because you're giving back, you know, and, and you're amongst, amongst the community. Got to really get in depth uh, with the, how the rugby landscape is out in the boroughs there. Uh, so yeah, I was just, I was just doing that. And, and Old Blue has always been really good with connections and stuff, especially for guys who maybe want to have more of a career and still play rugby. But for me, I was always so focused on playing rugby. It was just like, I'll just coach kids make pennies, but you know, yeah. I get to live the dream. I, I get, to get to go train. I get to show up to practice yeah. early and, and all those other things. So, well, there's an argument it worked for you. So <laughs> for sure. So we're so. sitting here. And, and so let's talk a bit more about getting closer to the now is the MLR. And yep. you are one club guy in the MLR. You've been at San Diego Legion from the beginning. Talk me through how you got here, MLR coming up and year one, Nate suiting up for the Legion. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's funny because when I got cut from the sevens, it was by Matt Hawkins. He's the head coach. Uh, but Matt Hawkins was the same guy who called me up in 2018 and said, hey, you know, San Diego Legion um, is going to be coached by Rob Holdley. Do you want to come out and play for us? Uh, and so I, I jumped at it. I was actually uh, working at a, um, at a coffee roasting company. Mm. Uh, I was kind of doing a bit of like, all right, how can I sustain my my life and my career but also still do rugby and uh mlr fell into my lap um and so i moved i moved out to san diego year one and uh never really looked back i guess <laughs> it, it was great though because i knew um i'd been teammates with mikey teo since 2012 when i joined the usa sevens team i was teammates with ryan mattias in 2013 with the sevens those guys were here they played for pro rugby san diego so I, uh, I knew I was going to have some guys that I, that I really love that, that I consider to be brothers off the field, but also great teammates. And um, yeah, that, that first year was a bit crazy because it was like the ARC was right in the middle of the season. So I actually only played a couple games for Legion, went to USA, came back, played a few more games um, and was lucky enough to get into the playoffs and, and play with Legion. So, but uh, yeah, and then the following year was 2019 and we got to the final and you know, became runner ups, runner ups that year, 2020, we were undefeated five and oh, COVID strike, you know, so we've, we've really just been trying to, trying to get ourselves back into a place where, where this is it. We all, we all have that feeling in the clubhouse that uh, a championship is, is what we're here for and we're not going to accept anything less. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty excited for what 2023 holds and, and the journey to get to that spot has been up and down and we've gone through our trials and tribulations um, over 2021 and 2022, especially myself. I've had a couple injuries, so I'm just looking to stay healthy and, and contribute to this team. Nice, and you know, how has the MLR grown, like professionalism to the, the size of the comp to everything? For you, someone who's been here from its infancy to now, like what's your assessment of that? No, I, I mean, it's, it's grown leaps and bounds. If I just use Legion as an example, um, We've always had great people that have gone out of the way to make sure that Legion, us players, have had facilities. We had Exos as a training facility, which is great. Um, we had uh, Proteus or um, Jason Huntley's Proteus out in Poway that we would go to, and that was unbelievable. But if you look at where that was to 40-minute drives and a lot of running around, um, you know, Save, actually one of our old teammates, used to say, he's a Fijian guy, he used to say, uh, play rugby and sit in traffic. You know, that's what, he, that's what he called being here. He's like, sit in traffic and play rugby. That's us. That's what we do every day. Where now um, the professionalism is kind of through the roof because we have our own HQ. We have our own gym, our own facility. We have our own locker room. We have our own space that has like our identity and like our, you know, kind of the legacy of what San Diego Legion is here. And And you see that across the league. You see it you know, they're promoting it on their social media. They're, 
you know, that much more involved in the community. I think that's the other part of the, how much more professional it's getting is like really how much are you giving back and, and doing in the community. And I think that's grown across the league massively. And, and you know, MLR has done great to make sure there's incentives for that, for, for teams that are going to be going out there and making sure that they spread the game. So I, I think it just every year, this competition has gotten better and better. And it, you know, it's, it's passed some players by that were there in year one, you know, it's kind of outgrown some guys. And I'm just, I'm fortunate enough to still be here and still say that, you know, I'm elite player and I still play this at the highest level in the MLR. And so say when you look at, um, at, the, at the Legion and, you know, we talked about, you just said how they have an HQ and how they have, not all MLR teams have that. There'll be a lot of guys listening to this or watching this who at other MLR teams going, man, like we, we still don't have an HQ. We still don't have a gym. Like yeah. we still don't have all this. Like you gotta be kind of grateful for where we are in San Diego, the ownership group to have this facility for us, to allow us to play in Snapdragon this season. There's gotta be some credit to those guys who've kind of given this club a lot of resources to be successful. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Those guys have gone, uh, like I said, leaps and bounds from where we were year one. And, and every year there's an intention to improve things and make things better. And if you look at just from last year with our coaching staff and the guys, you know, they've kept all those guys together and the preparation over the last six months behind closed doors without guys on the team being around and stuff, it's like night and day. So you, you gotta be excited about that, let alone, you know, one of our biggest strengths here at Legion was that you know, every team gives you their best their best crack when you're playing in a stadium like Torero, yeah. right? So we sell out Torero in 2019 in the final, and it's like, man, that that was special. And to me, it just feels like now that we have Snapdragon, we can recapture some of that, and that only makes us a better club yeah. when when we get the best out of our competition. And so, say the last two seasons of Legion have been, you know reasonably unsuccessful compared to say where you were up to 2020 and the 2019 season before that um like how do you feel about those seasons and potentially what would you put some of that down to um i mean i mean i feel i feel down about the seasons you know it's it's one of those things like if i if i peel all the layers back of what legion is and, and trying to win championships and stuff like a, as a person you always got good people we've always had good people in the building right so it's it's not to not to anybody's fault that we you know we don't treat each other like crap in this building which is great and we have a lot of really good relationships and connections which is great but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to compete to the highest order and that you're going to hold each other to the highest standard all the time so it's always been truly enjoyable environment to be around um which you know i'm grateful for as a as a person and as a man but as a rugby player, that's just not good enough to me. Um, it's not what I want here. I want everybody to come here and be desperate to win championships because, I mean, yeah, it's just, that's that's what the game is yeah, about. That's I what mean. I love. You know, I, I really love competing. Like every, every day over stupid stuff, over serious stuff, and the serious stuff to us in this building needs to be championships. And I wouldn't say that we lack that. I just think we didn't really, uh, we didn't really have the, have the aggression or like the the complete desire to make sure that we do whatever we do outside of the building as well as in the building to get it done. And uh, you know, this year that's gonna have to change. This year people are gonna have to have hard conversations with each other regardless of whether you're their friend or not. And uh, we just gotta make sure that we're all going in the same direction. <laughs> A reminder that San Diego Legion single game tickets are now on sale as well as season tickets. Do not miss it. You can get them at the San Diego Legion website or on Instagram at SD Legion. All the links are up on there. It's going to be a good ride at Snapdragon Stadium. Don't miss it. And where are some areas, say, on the field that you feel like will be improved this year or, or you can already sense, you know, areas that were we'll work on last year that have been addressed? Yeah, I think, I mean, we got we got you helping us in the engine room, right? I think that's a that's a big help. And that's like a coach coach to player. Like, you're a high-energy guy. We need that type of energy. And, and maybe we've lacked some of that energy in our forward pack or maybe we've lacked a bit of identity where – you know, we've signed guys like Isaac Ross, who's going to come in and make a big impact. Uh, we got Tom Franks back, who had a brief stint with us in 2021, but actually was a really influential player for us that year when he did come on. So I think um, I think 
our set piece is going to improve, uh, which is great, but also just like the mindset. So a lot of the guys that we've brought in now um, appear to be pretty, uh, pretty mobile guys, guys who are going to play the game at a high pace guys who aren't going to shy away from us ramping up the tempo guys who are going to want to want to get into teams get stuck into guys you know so to me i just look around at that and um, yeah i just get excited about it and i think that's something that that we were when we were most successful and that we'll be able to reignite this year with the players and then so so let's look a little bit more to to this year and, and what's going on you know traditionally at legion you've been like the main nine it's always like you've been the flagship nine this year with richard judd coming in you know that i think to win a league you've got to have depth at nine and i think that's just a reality richard judd's an amazing player how do you feel as a player with that environment you are a leader in this environment as well yeah i think um for me if I want to win a championship, it's not going to be because Nate Augsburger did the whole thing. Like it's, it's got to be, let's get as many of the best players that we can into this building and let's go do it. And so like we have Jason Higgins returning as well, who played really well um, last year uh, when I was out. And then we have Richard Judd coming in, who's obviously going to add more value. So if you look at us three all on a roster, if I'm a GM, if I'm David Haig and I'm sitting there looking at that, I'm going, all right, this is like, this is, this is championship level depth experience. This is what we need at that position, right? And so look across the board and you see other guys' names on the rosters. I think that's that's something that the, the, uh, the higher ups have done really well. They've been able to look across the squad regardless of whether I've been here for six years or not. They've been able to look across the squad and go, this is what we're gonna need if we're gonna actually pull this thing off and, and go do it. So. That, that's all I'm really worried about and concerned about, man. Yeah. They, those guys know I'm going to compete hard as hell either way, you know. So. I, and I think, bro, I think it just raises your game. Like from the outside yeah. in, you know, I can understand how some people might be like, oh, but I think the way to look at it is, hey, mate, if now that starting nine shirt, just even getting to that shirt means a little bit more. You know what I mean? Yeah. Shows a little bit more about you, keeps you on your toes, stomps out complacency, lights a fire, lots of positives sort of and there. I, and I, I wouldn't be like this. That wouldn't be foreign to me either, because like even when I first joined the team, Nick Boyer was on our team. And uh, in the first season, when I when our playoff game came and I came back from the Eagles, I started on the wing. Nick Boyer was a starting nine. So I, I've, I've been able to get myself onto the field, fortunately, because I can play wing or I can yeah. play nine. But um, it's not foreign to me to have somebody competing behind me, which is like you said, it, it just makes just makes you better and you have to embrace that if you want to be great and you want to win championships completely agree and so that was like my, my gets around to my next question sort of playing nine has always been sort of your preferred position but say with the eagles this fall you, you most of your your game time was was on the wing mm -hmm. um there's a chance that could be happening at times with judd this season as well like how do you feel about playing on the wing to playing at nine like I, I'm guessing it's kind of from your sevens background, like we talked about, yeah. that gives you that sort of all-round game that allows you to be able to, to go back and forth. But, yeah. but how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm deadly from 40 meters out. Yeah. So, like, that's why I get away with playing on the wing and I have good defense, right? So I can stop people. I'm not scared under the high ball. I'm, I've got good ball skills and stuff, and I can finish from 40 out. Like, you, don't ask me to do a Ryan Mattias and finish from 80 out. You know, I'll probably need some support. But... You know, for me, it's it's it generally speaking comes down to uh, what does the team need, and um, you know, as a leader on that last USA tour, our backs coach Steve Brett, he sat me down and he was just like, "Hey man, listen, like going into this uh, qualification tournament, like we're we're gonna need you on the wing," and you know, and that conversation was pretty be brief because at that point, you know, you got to take everything in context. At that point, with where we were. It wasn't the moment for me to sit there and be like, question like, oh, well, why, why not play me at nine, even though I'd love to play there. It was like, it was like, what do we got to do to win? If that's it, if you believe that, then I'm in, Yeah. you know? So, and you know, that mentality has never really let me down. If anything, it gets me on the field so I can make an impact. I don't want to be on the sideline. No, I, I want to be you. out. So. And, and that's my question. My question is, is would you, if someone said to you, you can either sit on the bench at nine or you could start at wing. What would you say? Nine times out of 10, I'll start on the wing. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense it's to just, me. Yeah. It, it just gives me an opportunity to play the game I love and, and do what I do. And, and they're two different mindsets. Yeah. You know, wing's actually pretty fun. There's, there's a lot less 
uh, like overall technical responsibility with what the team's doing. Um, you got to know your role and stuff, obviously, still, but you get to express yourself a little bit, and, and the game's a bit different out there. But I do love being in the heat. I love being in amongst it. You That's like kind of people me. around. Yeah, you yeah, like yeah, barking bro. orders and like, forwards and yeah. stuff. I know you, bro. I love that. I love that. And and I think the biggest, the, one of my biggest strengths as a nine is that I will always threaten the defense. So yeah. they always have to account for me where, you know, there's other nines, their games aren't like that. Their games are, are based on different things. So And then, you know, from the type of player you are, you always, from what I've observed, you seem to find yourself in some form of leadership roles. You speak well, you lead by example, you've kind of always risen or grown to that? Is that something you've had since a young age? Is that something that's more developed as Nate's got a little bit more seasoned? Like how, how, how do you feel about your leadership skills? Uh, I think, I think I've always, uh, I've always uh, like put, was willing to put in the hard work. You know, like we, we all respect guys who you can tell like, dang, he's busting tail, yeah. right? At a, at a bare minimum. Like if I know that that dude's going to go as hard as he can, like there's just a, a bit of respect there. So I've always been that guy. Um, I just think like, you know, I was a, I was a captain on my, my high school football team as well. Um, I was a captain of my rugby teams growing up. I was a captain of my wrestling team my sophomore year. So I guess you'd say I've always yeah. had a bit of leadership and my dad's always been really good. Even when I was like 10 years old, he, like all my buddies growing up, they'd be like, man, your dad gives the best halftime speeches, <laughs> you know? And so I don't, I don't really, I don't pride myself on giving halftime speeches, but I do think there's like a, a bit of leadership that I've always kind of had. And uh, yeah, man, I just, I embrace it. and. But, I love it. Yeah, bro. It's awesome. Like, I, it's something I've I've noticed of you. And so, you know, let's just look a little bit on the Eagles. Touched on it at the beginning. But, you know, not making the World Cup for the first time since 1995. You know, a few chances. I think you were you involved in all of them from Uruguay to Chile yep. to this one. Yep. Like, one, what's your assessment? And two, where, what do you think needs to change for the future? So... My assessment is is obviously like pretty pretty disappointed that we we didn't actually get it done, right? And uh, hats off to the effort from everybody, but I've felt for a little while bias in this position. Like I've backed up at scrum half for a lot of times. Like you said, I've, I've found myself on the wing for this last qualification tour. I don't know if we've played the style that that as Americans we want to be playing. Um, and I think that goes a long way. I mean, obviously, uh, we have quality players. We have quality guys who can play the kicking game in the style that we've we've relied on for the last few years uh, with Gary Gold. But to me, I just felt like uh, like we've been missing a little bit of that. That all right? What's the American style? And to us, and to a player like myself, it's like, bro, we want to run. Yeah. We want to shoot shots from everywhere, yeah. and we want to be fit the fittest team and the most you know dynamic team that you could have it's kind of it's kind of similar to how how japan has approached their international rugby you know they just said this is the way we're going to play we're going to yeah. be fit enough to do it and sometimes it'll come off and other times but they're a fun exciting team to watch and to me that's i think that kind of turns into the second part of the question which is like what where do we want to go and how do we want to be seen as a usa team and and to me it's it's got to be exciting something that wraps people in, yeah. something where they get to see one-on-ones, they get to see us taking people on, um, which I don't think we've, we've done it. Yeah. I don't think we've, or at least we haven't, we haven't shown it that yeah. we could just go out and do that against some of these teams, which we were putting, you know, 40 plus points on yeah. in 2017. And, and then the, the tables have turned now. No, I agree. And I think that's probably the biggest, in my opinion, critique of Gary is, you know, he didn't have loads of time together, especially at the end. And so there's yeah. a massive mitigating factor and, and uphill battle that he faced with logistical issues, which is a whole podcast you could do on its own. But I even said this to him, to his face, so I have no time, no problem saying this on here, is I said, at some point we have to commit to playing. Like we're playing the percentages right now, but the minute you're a tier, a tier two side and you try and take a tier one on at beating with the nuts and bolts and percentages of the game, 99.9999% of the time, you're not going to win those exchanges. They're right. just, you're not going to out box kick, out maul, out scrum, out, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like out kick a top tier one side. Like they, they're bulletproof there through their whole lives where we're catching up to get there. But what do we have that they don't have? America has more Polynesians than the islands. Like we have the ball carriers, the power, we have not just Polynesians, like incredible athletes across the board, play to our strengths, play to our athleticism. We're fortunate to have a few halfbacks that are actually able to play 
a, a more expansive game. I just think at some point you've got to commit to it. It's not going to happen Agreed. overnight. It's probably going to take, you know, two World Cup cycles. Mm -hmm. But then there's a chance the Eagles are like a Japan one day where they have a style. They've committed to it. You know, eventually there's going to be more funds where you boys will eventually be central contracted in the off season. You'll have more time together. You might even get a central contract club team one day. You know, who knows what could happen? But for me, it's like at some point you've got to commit to what type of team you want to be. Because if you want this game to go well in America, the Eagles got to be competitive, one. But they've got to be exciting. You've got to give them big hits, big carries, try, things to cheer, you know, things to create new fans. Moments like I work on NBC Sports, like we're shining a light on the game. Give me the story to sell. Give me USA putting the flag in the ground. <laughs> Maybe, you know, it wasn't their day, but like this yeah. is how we how we roll. And I could anyone can sell that story. You know, yeah. it, it's it's water, it, it, it's ice to the Eskimo. I still think you can sell it. Like it's it's that it's that convincing, you know. So 100%. for me, it's one of the areas that I definitely think can be addressed. And the other one is probably just giving you guys a schedule and consistency. Because mm -hmm. how different was it when you guys had the ARC and you were playing for the 15s teams yep. of identity, getting on point to what you've done these last couple of years? Yeah, I mean that's five. That's five extra weeks that we haven't gotten the last few years. That's five, and those weeks are huge, especially when that tournament was used to to get new guys in because we didn't always have the foreign uh, players that could get off of their con yeah. their time and, and come play in those competitions. So, you know, it really did have that American feel to it. Um, and I, I, you know, I always go, I, I can only go off my own experience, but like John Mitchell trained that for yes. us. And that was something that was working and, and felt fun and, and enjoyable to us. You know what I mean? So yeah. just, just based on like, if I was comparing the two, you're right. It's something that we got to train and you just like, it's a mindset thing. And it'd be no different here in the Legion building. If we want to play a caliber rugby that's like that, you do have to train it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So, well, you just got to commit to it at some point. Yeah. Like if you ever want to be there, at some point you got to take the first step. You know what I mean? You got to, you got to start the journey. Yeah. And like, um, and, and I think the US hasn't quite done that. And a lot of that's been like minimal time together, a lot of emphasis on results. Mm -hmm. So going to a more, statistically probability a safer game plan has been the move but at some point you got to take take the brakes off and right. like and, and commit and be afraid take your training wheels off and fall off your bike a couple of times but eventually you'll be cycling around the place you know having a great time and, exactly. I, and, I, and I think that's probably one thing we touched on there and so if we look at you know the fact they're not in the world cup do you think that's like a setback for the sport here because there's so much positive like the mlr is popping off um, it's the best on paper that team's the best it's ever been able to be fielded mm -hmm. with level of professionals, the talent, the uh, internationals coming in. Like the game is growing. There's a World Cup on the horizon, but USA not in 2023. It's still a big blow. Like it's still got to have a ripple effect. Do you think? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it's undoubtedly like not only for uh, for fans and spectators, but obviously our our guys getting those experiences and and stuff like that. I just to to me, it, it it couldn't be that big of a blow. Like I, I went to 2019 Rugby World Cup. Uh, it was an amazing experience, you know. But like, as American rugby players, like our our lives aren't changing when we get back home from that event because everybody was watching and it was the biggest thing in the world. So to me, it's like there are still so much levels of foundation that need to be built before we go to a World Cup and everybody's like, wow. NBC's on there. They got they got the dude, the main guys who are talking about all the other big sports, and they're going, "Oh, did you guys see yeah. USA Rugby?" Like we don't have that yet. We've had it some with the Sevens. Yeah. Sevens has gotten some good uh, press and like Sports Center, the yeah, Danny Barrett. Yeah, clip, that's what I mean. So thing. like the the Sevens has gotten some of that, and like it, to be expected, a bit more exciting, a bit less going on, a bit easier to like catch the eye, right? But Fifteens hasn't even scratched that surface yet. So to me. Yeah, disappointing setback for sure. But also like the thing that I've said to everybody is just like, gosh, like whoever does come out from now and comes into 2027 and we qualify for that Rugby World Cup, we're going to have a very, very tough minded group of players that have felt this loss, have been able to carry that, have been able to groom that and build that into something that's better. In 2027, we'll have some, we'll some hard-nosed dudes, man. Yeah. Some dudes that are really ready to go and 
say, all right, we didn't even play last one. We didn't even get the chance to do it. And now it's here. Exactly. Uh, th- I, I think, think the that'll hunger be and special. The passion, like- yeah, that'll be special, man. And you should be hyped for that for a World Cup anyways. But there's a difference. There's a difference to, to falling short and then uh, having to turn Well, look at like Portugal. You saw how much that, that was and meaning every- to them in that game and everything. And when we've never had that feeling of missing out for so long. Now missing out, I feel there definitely will be a reactionary fire yeah. the next time round because of now the experience this feeling you don't want it again like it's right. actually the line in the sand that gets drawn where you have to fix the problems or you, you're just going to be in the same cycle but i feel like that's usa done we've talked about legion i want to just talk a bit about you away from rugby mm. well still with rugby but away from the field like you've slowly layered like more strings to your bow you know from the quick tap podcast which you've had for multiple years now mm-hmm. like you know, you've got um, product of rugby as well. A few other projects, you coach, you do other things. Like, you know, let's just talk with the, the podcast first. Like one, what made you want to do it? Mm. How have you found it? And then what are sort of the long-term potential aspects of doing this? Is there a reason media after rugby? Where, where do you see yourself? I think, I think um, you know, uh, speaking is a strength of mine. I think I, I've... I, I'm good at that. I can do that like like nothing. Um, that was one thing. But I think for me, it was more of trying to get these these athletes and their stories out to understand what it's actually taking to do this journey. And uh, that could be from a guy like Ebner, Nate Ebner, who's you know had an absolutely insane journey and pathway to his Olympic rugby career and what he did. And then you know to guys like me and Ryan Mattias who've kind of you know, slept on couches, done what, done what we've needed to do to make sure that we uh, that we can live our dream. So the podcast was great and I, I really enjoyed it because it was just a, a way to connect, but also uh, try and give the audience an uh, authentic look into what's going on and, and how the makeup of guys' lives are, you know, trying to be a professional rugby player in America, um, quite drastically different from a lot of uh, other sports. Um, so yeah, that's been great. And I think the primary th- prim- primary thing from the podcast, and it kind of led into Product of Rugby, is that I think there's a very unique uh, connection uh, with rugby across the world, but definitely in America, where it's like a buzzword. And you know, if you say it, even if someone didn't play it, they're like, oh, a buddy of mine played in college. And like, I don't know, there's just like this sense of, the sense of unity. Um, and if somebody did play it, it's like full on conversation. Yeah. Like I'm, I, I might've even known you it, for a while. Exactly. You know what I mean? Well, it's kind of like you're in this secret club and you find out the other person's in the club with you. Where when I grew up in England, like everyone, can't, it's it's not like that. Where here, it's very much like, oh, you yeah. know rugby too? Like we're in this, you know what I mean? Like Exactly, uh, like, exactly. Cause it is such a fringe niche, like kind of uh, unique sort of pot, like, path to be a rugby fan yeah. in america and uh, and then so like how have you actually found doing the podcast like did you enjoy it do you think media is something you want to look to afterwards i enjoy it man I, I wear a lot of different caps like you said i coach i do all this stuff i thought the podcast stuff was great i really did enjoy it, yeah. it you know it really it really helped me uh fine tune being in front of a camera and and kind of having having a script, but also being able to just yeah. be yourself and, and chat and stuff. So, I, I mean, I would I would love to be doing media stuff. I yeah. think there's there's definitely a gap and a place for it here in America, yeah. right? Eventually, MLR is going to be where it is, and USA Rugby is going to be where it is, and there's going to be a there's going to be a desire, there's going to be uh, a supply, for, uh, a demand for it. Hundred so. percent, bro. Like I, the reason I asked that is because one, I know the transition to media is just reps, reps in the saddle. Mm. You don't have the right KPIs, be able to speak, be able to do, you know, certain things like you're saying, talk and and be able to, you know, no lines and script, but then also just be able to converse and like where to look on camera. All these different things take reps in the saddle. But for me, from the outside, I, I think you're destined to be in the media mm. afterwards. I think America's still searching for good American voices to cover this sport. MLR is still in its infancy of broadcasting capabilities. But for me, from the outside, the fact you've taken the time for these reps now, the fact you're still playing, like the fact you, you're invested in the game, like if I'm MLR, if I'm the rugby network or whatever down the line, I'm, I'm looking at as soon as you're not playing anymore, I'm scooping you up. Like Petri's done a great job. I feel like you, Mike has, you, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Like it's Mike's done a great same, job. Same, same mold, same guy. You've been in this sport and your ability to talk and, and feel comfortable, I think for me, stands out uh, like from a mile. And, and, I, and I think it's a credit to you and it shows um, it, it shows as you know that 
your thinking or planning for later? Because I think it is an important aspect that, you know, with my transition to media, one of the things that's fortunate, last two, three years of my career, I was injured so much that I ended up doing so much media stuff that I actually got loads of reps, you know, yeah. that it helps. And, yeah. and, I, and, and I think that's, that's something that helped me on my journey. So I've always just kind of noticed that from the outside in. The other thing I really wanted to touch on was, uh, you know, product of rugby and your yeah. brand. This is your brand. Tell us a little bit about it, like how it started, what it is. Yeah. Go, give it, it to it us. Was the, it was the COVID dream, right? So me and uh, a guy, Chris Johnson, who I was doing the podcast with, we started talking and, you know, uh, we came up with this idea like, oh, what is, what is Nate? You know, Nate's a product of rugby. And then it was like, all right, well, that's, that's kind of a good little play on words. And so that's kind of where it started. And uh, we came up with the idea that we wanted to show unity. We wanted to show a universal rugby brand, right? One that doesn't have to affiliate with your team. It doesn't have to affiliate with anything. It just says, I, I play You're rugby. in the club. I'm that's in the right. club, yeah, right. I, I play about. rugby and, and I know what that sport is and I'm a part of it, whether you're a parent who takes your kid to go play it and you never played, whether you're a volunteer, referee, whatever. I, it's really like all levels, all levels, anybody, any people. And you know, as we know, rugby on a grassroots level is so such a uh, binding sport. You know, you feel like you belong there. It, it doesn't take long. I actually was in, uh, I was in Massachusetts. I tell people this all the time. And, you know, I was already playing for the Eagles and these club rugby dudes had no idea who I was. They come up to me and he goes, hey man, like what, what size boot are you? You want to play? Like, do you want to get in the B-side game? Like I got cleats and I was like, yeah, no, nah, I can't play, bro. I can't play. But, um, you know, it's just, to me, that's that's very cool. And like, that's something like, as, even as a believer with my with my faith and stuff, like we're meant to be uh, together. We're meant to be, you know, talking, finding ways to, to relate. Cause we all go through a lot of the same things. We all go through similar things. So, and rugby is just kind of this untapped gem. And and I just think, man, this, should, this game should be playing, be playing everywhere and, and all over the place. And unfortunately right now it's not played everywhere, but it will be. Yeah. And I want to be a, a guy who delivers the delivers the core values to the community. Um, one of our big things, inclusion, respect, and then charity. So in our first couple uh, years, we raised over $1,000 for Feeding America's Children. So uh, yeah, low, low food security uh, families and stuff like that. But moving forward, we want to make a greater impact in, in the rugby community and, and give more to maybe people who've had hard times in their clubs, maybe a club is, is struggling or, or a player is struggling to join a club and they just need their their dues paid. Yep. Like little things like that to, to big things like someone getting an injury on the field yep. and now they're struggling to get medical bills paid. Like, like these are the kind of things that we wanna do and be out in the community, promoting the great things about rugby, encouraging people to find out more about it. And obviously I'm super passionate about it um, and I, that's that's pretty much it. And so it's, it's mainly it, merch right now. So it's, it's mainly merch right now, man. We're we're just you know we got some cool we got cool stuff. We got you know people check it out. You hit it, bro. You hit know them. what I mean? Hit like, them with the you know, we got <laughs> we got the little we got the product of rugby flat bill hat, which is actually gonna go to my friend Corbs. And you know oh I'll he, take it. Bro. You know I'll it's funny it. he wore a hat it. today. Yeah I know my he hat wore is a hat mess. today, but he never wears a hat. Yeah he's probably got a hat like five just, size bigger than mine. Yeah no for those listening, unfortunately a lot of this will be on audio. I'm just putting on the snapback product of rugby. He's putting on a product of rugby. This snapback. is marketing people. That's an original. This, this is oh, this is original marketing. That's that's original. Last in stock. All right. There's gonna be more stuff coming out, more apparel and things like that. Where but can they um, find it? Tell us. Where they can they? find it. Um, it's on my Shopify through Bushi Athletic. They're our primary vendor. Um, they're the ones who are gonna be floating out our original products, but also we're gonna be creating some new ones. So there will be apparel on site and. Uh, yeah, just anybody in local Southern California, if you ever see me, you ever want to get involved, I need support, I need help, and I just want to keep pushing the game forward and continue to drive rugby into different communities and, and be a part of it. So that's our goal. That's awesome, bro. I think that's a good way to end. That kind of sums up the dude you are, product of rugby. Why I want to do this pod, man. Like, uh, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. We appreciate it. Good luck with preseason, bro. I know it's just about to really start getting Tasty for you boys, but I'm sure all, all our fans who are watching loved it and all those listening as well would have loved it. So thanks for your honesty, yeah. your insight. For everyone listening, uh, thanks thanks for this. You know, we've got to thank Nate again for coming on. 
It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Corbs. Appreciate it, man. All right, guys. Well, that is a wrap on this episode. A reminder to keep checking out on the San Diego Legion socials. These episodes will be dropping weekly. Nate Orsberger, there you've done it. Keep an eye on our next guest. Lots of exciting stuff as we get into the build to this season. A reminder that tickets are on sale, single games and season tickets. You can check it out at the San Diego Legion website or check them out at, at SD Legion on Instagram. All the links are on their page. Thanks again for Alex Corbusera, Nate Orsberger, and all of us at the San Diego Legion. We'll see you again next time. A reminder that San Diego Legion merchandise is on sale on the San Diego Legion website. You can go to Instagram at SD Legion and find all the links there. Take yourself to the website. I've got one of the flat brim caps, absolutely in love with it. Wearing the t-shirts, so much choice on there. Check it out because you want to rep the Legion this season. Oh,